Welcome, welcome everyone. Hello, hello. I see we have so many attendees. I see some people coming in from New York, Los Angeles. So we are so happy to have you here with us. And I was enjoying that funky version of Toxic. Um, we love me some Britney Spears, let me just tell you. Um, anyway, thank you, thank you for joining us for our very popular ongoing online lecture series where we're talking to fabulous costume designers, especially now during award season. I'm Nick Varios and I am co-chair of the fashion design department, theater costume design department and film and TV costume design department right here at FIDM, the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising. And if any of you who are attending this wonderful online conversation are interested in costume design, especially for film and TV, we have an amazing, amazing program, film and TV costume design program right here at FIDM. So go to FIDM.edu for more information. All right, today, today, tonight, our very, very special guest is costume designer Nancy Steiner. So let's give a little bit of an introduction, a bio, a brief bio before we bring her on. Nancy Steiner's career started in the late 1980s, styling bands for music videos and assisting on films and commercials. Nancy has worked with bands including, are you ready for this? Stone Temple Pilots, REM, The Smashing Pumpkins, Nirvana, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Foo Fighters, no doubt, David Bowie and Bjork, just to name a few. I think I've named all the top ones. <laughs> she has worked with directors Sofia Coppola, Michelle Gondry, Peter Jackson, and many more. Some of the films and TV shows she has costume designed include Safe in 1995, The Virgin Suicides in 1999, Lost in Translation in 2003, Little Miss Sunshine in 2006, Twin Peaks, 2017, and now Promising Young Woman. Nancy Steiner has recently received a Critics' Choice Award nomination for Best Costume Design, as well as a CDG for Promising Young Woman. And she has won two, two CDG Costume Design Guild Awards for co Commercial Costume Design for Call of Duty video game, as well as for Cardi and Cola. Ladies and gentlemen, and anybody else in between, please give a warm welcome to costume designer, Nancy Steiner. <laughs> oh, hello, how are you doing? <laughs> there she is, woo! Everybody, let's do Hi. virtual clapping. Woo! There's that light. <laughs> oh, there's that light. <laughs> there's that afternoon light that I told you about. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I know we we are it's it's this time of the day afternoon that we film all of a sudden it's gonna it's gonna get dark here in Los Angeles, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we love I, I see a hint of a red ceiling. Is that correct? Yes. <gasps> oh bravo. And I know this because we had a pre-hello. There is somebody that you're hiding. So if you would like to tilt your head, there he is. That's my guy. Just uh, This is the portrait gallery in my house. Nice. So there's portraits everywhere. I love it. Now who painted that? That's a thrift store painting. Really? I have a lot of thrift store. And then actually both my friends, this is Casey Cole and this is John Huck. Both nice. My Nice, I love it, I love it. Well, everybody, please welcome Nancy Steiner. We're so honored to have you. Um, we, we love you, we love your films, we love your provenance, where you come from. So let's, before we get to Promising Young Woman and other films, we really, really need to talk about where you started and how you got your beginnings, because I think, you know, some people may not know this. So at least I like to, you know, let people know that you, you, do, you do have a provenance and you do, <laughs> have enough of a provenance that you could shake your hair and your hoop earrings all that you want to. <laughs> um, you know, in particular, you know, you became the go-to stylist for every hot rock band, which I kind of mentioned, and musician. I know that you scored a gig working at Nana, um, the punk clothing mecca and go-to destination for stylists needing outfit bands, music videos. Of those of you, if you don't know, Nana 
was huge in LA in the 80s and 90s. And um, I remember, I think they were the only US distributor of Doc Martens, is that correct? Yeah, we were the first distributor of uh, Doc Martens and Creepers in the United States. Wow. We had a whole wholesale business. Um, yeah, it was, it was big back then. Um, so we still, we sold to every store in the U.S. They had to come had to, to Nana's. They had to come to you. Huh? They had to come to you. They had to come to Nana's. They came to wow. us and then we distributed them. Yeah. Amazing. So it's, it's, I mean, you can't really overstate the importance of, of the stores of Nana's. Um, and it really, I think at the time, I mean, I'm sure you, you, I wonder if you would agree with this. It was sort of like the social gathering place. It was yeah. MySpace before MySpace. It was Facebook before Facebook. It was, it, you know, it that this is where this is where y'all found out what what's going on. <laughs> it was very much a, a family and a place and a you know to gather. I mean, it was the punk rock scene, and you know, you kind of found your tribe there because people were shopping there for their looks or their dms or whatever and i have a lot of great friends that i made from working there that i'm still friends with i have my crew of nana girls that i'm still <laughs> we we are still wow. a crew and um it was really a great place to be it was like the center of things in santa monica i didn't live in santa monica but that's where the store was and yeah um, it was it was on Broadway. Well, it was right? on yeah, it was on Broadway and Second. Yeah. Yeah, wow. and then it moved later after I left. It moved to Third Street Promenade, but when I worked there, the Third Street Promenade was a ghost town. Oh yeah, yeah. There was like a pizza place, a barber shop, and <laughs> the Hard Krishna restaurant. Oh no, I, I know. <laughs> uh, I was at UCLA late eighties, and I know I'm going to age myself, but I don't. I don't care. And and um, my husband David was at UCLA also, and I remember, and he had an apartment in Venice, and he would just be like, um, "I think we got broken in like already three times in one week." And I mean, he just talks about it like it, you know, this is Venice and Third Street Promenade, in Santa Monica. He talked about it like he was in in Baghdad, you know, yeah, <laughs> or no, something. It was, it was <laughs> dangerous, you know. It was not <laughs> cool back then to be there at all. So but. let's talk about some of your, your uh, people may not realize, I'll just mention some of, of the stars and musicians um, and, and, and the influence as a stylist that you had. Gwen Stefani, no doubt, polka dot dress in Don't Speak, I'm not gonna sing it, <laughs> the Don't Speak video, where that came from, where that come from? Uh, that came, I think, from my closet. I'm pretty sure I, 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 I wore a ton of 40s dresses back then. That's pretty much all I wore. Um, and I remember Gwen was not into wearing dresses so much, and but everybody loved that dress on her so much. And it kind of felt right for the song because it was kind of romantic and soft and sweet. Right. Um, so yeah, so we got her to wear it. And, um, you know, I worked with No Doubt on, I think four or five different videos mm. after Don't Speak. If you look around, I'm, I'm, I'm in each one <laughs> somewhere. Um, I'm, I've got blue hair in the, don't, is it Don't Speak? Yeah. Um, she turns around in the mirror, she's looking in the mirror and I'm behind her. So I'm in, I've got little cameos. That little love stuff. it. I love it. Well, I'm going to have to go back and see, see yeah. the videos. They're like, we need you. You've got the blue hair. Nancy, get, get, get over here. Come here. That was, that, was, that, that was just that one. And then I think I'm blonde in another one. I've had, I've had many different hair colors, you know. Love it. I love it. Okay. Another iconic moment. Um, I know that even some of the young, young, um, some of the young kids know this because it is so iconic. Kurt Cobain, the grandpa green cardigan sweater from the iconic MTV Unplugged performance. Um, so everybody who's attending, ladies and gentlemen, this young lady right here 
with her pink lapel jacket is the reason, <laughs> is, is the reason, and the, the wonderful lipstick is the reason that Kurt Cobain put on a green card. <laughs> now, 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 I cannot <laughs> take that credit. I'm sorry, Nick. I'm not gonna say that Kurt didn't have other sweaters like that. So <laughs> I can't take credit for that look. That was that was brunch, <laughs> you know, everybody had right. a mohair sweater. But I, I the, the sweater I got for him, he wears in the video, Come As You Are. And I, I don't know that it's the same one from In Bloom, but it's similar. So, I mean, I, I can't take credit for, I mean, <laughs> you know, we were all dressing in thrift clothes. Back right, then. right. That's all we wore. And Did you bring that with you? Was it, was it, was it? Yeah, was it was that... part of my, yeah, I just went thrift shopping basically yeah. for those videos and brought stuff. And if they liked it, they put it on or not, you know? So, you know, those guys didn't need stylists per You're se. Right, right. They, were, they weren't even looking really for that, but um, I got to come along and, and give them some stuff. And then I did the one um, video in Bloom, which was the black and white video. And I found those uh, striped suits yeah. for them um, that were actually in color. They were red, white, and blue, and they were from Western Costume. <laughs> and I was so lucky to find three suits because they were all very different sizes, you know, um, in the same, in the same uh, fabric. So that was, that was a score, as you would say. Wow, wow. Now, at the time, just to wrap it all up, did, because I know it was so early on, I mean, were, were we calling that position a stylist? We were calling that a stylist back then. Already, already by then. Yeah. Okay, nice, nice to know. Okay, are you guys ready? We're going to discuss Promising Young Woman. Of course, uh, the latest film that you've costume designed. And of course, it's just getting all, all the buzz. So, um, you know, we want to talk about the costumes. It's such, such an important part, an integral part of the film. Let's give a little bit of a, a brief synopsis of the film. Um, I'm gonna try not to give that much away, but briefly, nothing in Cassie's life is what it appears to be. She's wickedly smart, tantalizingly cunning, and she's living a secret double life by night. In the era of the hashtag Me Too reckoning, Promising Young Woman presents a story of revenge that is clever, comedic, and darkly entertaining. Carrie Mulligan that we see right here plays Cassie, a woman who dropped out of medical school and her best friend and classmate was sexually assaulted. And that is all I'm going to say. I think that's good, Nancy. What do you think? I think that's good. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> um, so let's start some, some easy, basic questions. How did you start your research? Um, you know, I know that you collaborated with Emerald, the director, and um, I, uh, I know that you had a short time to prep, if I'm not mistaken. So I wanna, I wanna hear about that because a lot of, I think a lot of people don't realize, um, you know, that, that there are times where you just don't have that much time to prep. And I love the story, I think. Talk about how you, you, you had a vision for Cassie, like daytime Cassie, and Emerald had another one. You're like, hmm, I like you that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, when I first read the script, which is just so brilliant, um, it just, you know, I thought, oh, I would really like to do this. And so I, I, you know, you go in and you meet with the director. And my first thought of Cassie's character on the page was she was stuck in this cafe and not moving on in her life and depressed and still living at home and my first thought was that maybe she's just kind of dark she doesn't care about what she looks like she's putting all this effort into this nighttime thing that she's doing but maybe she just is like in sweatshirts and t-shirts and not really paying attention maybe she's in darker tones mm -hmm. so, but I met with Emerald and Emerald said, oh, no, 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 no. I <laughs> want her to be feminine and floral and pastels and this like cotton candy world. Wow. And so I can take no credit for that either. Um, it was Emerald Fennell's choice and vision. 
And it really put an interesting twist on yeah. the character. Yet another interesting twist because this movie, almost every scene is some new information that you find out that you're like, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I said, great, let's go. <laughs> and we did, you know? Right, you're like, okay, I guess I'm not yeah. gonna go beige, I'm gonna go pink. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a lot of pink. Wow, that, I, love, I love that part where you, you, you have one direction and then the director says, no, this is what I'm thinking, you're thinking, Oh yeah! Oh, I love that twist because it's it's unexpected. You know, yeah. it really is. Now, if with, and this is what you know. Some something that we're talking about, sort of the daytime, Cassie. Um, and who was your inspiration? I know it was a a French uh, bombshell um, actress. To talk about that, yeah, Brigitte Bardot. Talk about that. Um, she was she was kind of our role model and our inspiration for Cassie, but. Not in the sex part way that Bridget Bardot is. Um, this was more about hair and colors and just this, you know, just a softness to her. So it was not a literal reference in a way. It was just a vibe and a feeling. And so yeah. we, um, but, you know, during her daytime, wanted her to be comfortable, casual. She's not showing off. She's not trying to be sexy or um, ever, you know, thinking in that way. But I think her daytime wear is also a kind of costume to um, cloak her inner feelings and her, her distress and her pain and suffering. She kind of puts on a candy wrapper as clothing to kind of just keep out all the bad keep up you know you don't have to ask me I'm fine everything's good you know and it was a bit of an armor like a cost you know another costume all right of right yeah. yeah I love because like you said she you know her her outward her wardrobe her armor looks like she's fun happy light friendly but as we find out she's anything but mm -hmm. and um and it was so subliminal yet you know it, it's out there you know and then you start peeling the the costume layers the wardrobe layers and this is what i i love about what you costume designers do because you you are you're 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 helping tell a story you're helping describe who the the the, the characters are through wardrobe and some people you know they people who are not in in this world might might they might not understand how um, relative and how important it is. You know, they just thinking, oh, she's just wearing a cute little top with pink flowers and jeans. What's, you know, what's the big deal? And, and I know that, I know we know that there's so much thought. So, you know, those of you attending, next time you watch a movie or a TV show, um, really pay close attention, you know. Um, wouldn't you agree? I like to say that if you don't even question that that person is a secretary or a lawyer or whatever, then the costume designer has done their job because it seems sort of seamless. Is that right? I mean, yeah, I do believe there's there's definitely films where um, when you don't notice, that's the best thing for the story. Obviously, there's there's stories you want to tell, and the costumes need to uh, shout or be louder. Um, but my work in contemporary costume, I like to just serve the story and, um, you know, in a way, yeah, hope that it's not noticed. <laughs> no, yeah. I love it. Let's talk about some of these individual looks. Um, you know, we talked about the day look, the barista, she's wearing the jeans, the sweet, happy prints, the colors, um, you know, and, and you talked about, it's all a disguise. Um, you know, she, she it, you know, she's all happy, but, you know, we know what's really going on. You used some items from Emerald's uh, sister, who's a uh, has a clothing line, Coco Fennel. Um, talk about some of those 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 items that you used. So we used. I don't know if there's. I think there might be an image of her with the baseball T-shirt with the red sleeves. Um, that is from Coco's line. I, when I found, I didn't know about Coco. And so of course, Emerald told me, she said, no pressure, but if there's anything you like, <laughs> you know, let's use it. And 
it was great. We did. We used this t-shirt and then we also used um, the dress. Yes, that's the that's the t-shirt. With the with the rainbow, right? With the yeah, rainbow, yeah. and there's like a little boy with a deer on it. I'm not really <laughs> sure what it means, but I kind of liked it. And then she wore for the first real date that she has with Ryan. She wore um, the cream dress with the big red roses all over it. And that was also from Coco's line. And I just, I loved it. Um, it just felt very um, kind of um, confident and, you know, dressed up, but not too dressed up and modern. And, uh, you know, she looked great in it. Yeah, no, she looked fun. It's like when I see her in the film, I just, she looks like a college you know, a, a college student in, in name a city, you know, it could be, it could be anywhere. It could be yeah. Silver Lake. It could be in San Diego. Yeah. It could be Kansas. It could, you know, um, and like you said, it's, it's um, the fun colors. You would never guess what's going on in her life. Um, you know, yeah, I love it. Did you shop at um, any other, any stores that you got some stuff from any, anything, um, you know, from any, and when you when you were thinking and looking at her daytime, the barista wardrobe, were you thinking of particular stores that just called out your name? You're like, oh yeah, that's where Cassie would shop. No, I I always kind of start. I like to start at the um, costume houses and okay. I like to look for interesting pieces um, that maybe are vintage but don't read vintage. Um, and so I start there. Of course, jeans and things like that, you want to get, um, you know, some newer, cooler ones. And I think we got some Levi's. I, I know we did shop at Urban Outfitters. <laughs> I, I, think, I think that leotard might be from there, that barista look um, with the little flowers on it. Um, but it was so, so, so quick. We did online shopping, you know, back then you could do that and then get it in a day. Um, I think Reformation we got the blue dress from, um, light blue dress. And so it's just like, for me, I don't feel like anybody dresses out of one store. You have to- Right. Everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, even, you know, if you live in a small town now in the United States, you can get anything online. So Anything online, online. yeah, from, from London, from Japan, wherever you, you yeah. go. Let's talk about the, the evening, her, her you know, her um, alter ego, some of the evening looks. This is one of the first, if not, you know, the first look we see, the, I call it business club, um, Cassians is the first yeah. look we see her in. Um, uh, I mean, I know, but... You know, explain maybe to some of the audience that may not have seen the movie yet, and we know that you better go see the movie. Why, why, why this? Um, so this is the first bar we see her in, and this is supposed to be a business bar. It's like the place that the guys go down the street after work from, you know, whatever they do in an office all day from nine to five. <laughs> um, pre-COVID, so pre-COVID. He's, you know, dressing to fit in and that's just you know your kind of typical white shirt black black suit you know it's not very special it's just very kind of pedestrian and anybody could wear it right and she doesn't want to stand out because she doesn't right. want anybody to know you know she could be somebody that they work with they just haven't met her you know exactly, exactly. Uh, she just happens to be pretend blackout drunk slurring <laughs> yeah. just happens to be yeah just happens to be mm -hmm. um all right next look do we have maybe a little bit of the euro trash i call it the euro trash club um cassie it's the the mini dress um look i know you barely see yeah the, is that would you would you is that from the i mean we never see her in the club right if i if i remember no, correctly. they're walking they're walking out of the club um, got it here so and, this mini dress, I mean, <laughs> once again, she puts on this costume perfectly. You know, the strapless mini dress, you know, she's giving you Vegas. She's got the hair extensions, um, you know, the whole look. Choker, she's got a like armband on the other arm that you don't, uh, you kind of see it there. Um, yeah, the high ponytail, it all came together really well um, with hair and makeup. 
you know. Um, so this was, yeah, as you said, uh, the Euro trash look. <laughs> um, and this gentleman, this actor, is actually one of the businessmen. Well, now you'll know this. It's not a big secret. <laughs> he's in the first bar scene. Ah, oh, okay. And he's there in a suit because he's there after work. But this is his. But he also weekend. goes to this this Euro trash club. This is his weekend look. Ah, this is what he thinks is cool on the weekend. Got it. Uh huh. So, <laughs> wow. Um, Got it. That's what really were you? I, I, I would love to know what you guys like. Here's Carrie Mulligan in the fitting with you, with Nancy Steiner, and um, you know all your assistant costume designer. Everybody's around, and and she puts on the dress. Like, what are you guys thinking? What are you? What are the the buzzwords? What are what what environment are you creating? Um, you know, for her um, in that in that fitting room. Um. I would just say kind of, you know, your tacky bar girl um, on a Friday night. You know, we're just like, let's get there. It's not supposed to look, I mean, it's it was supposed to be tacky. Let's right. Um, so um, that's where I'm going. I'm like, and which, you know, and we try on again, you know, you try on like 10 dresses and mm -hmm see which one photographs well, which one looks best, which one fits right, which feels right, and then send it to Emerald. You know? And, she <laughs> and she's like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> did you film any of her in the dress, like at the club, and, in, and did that just get cut off? Any, any, anything that you could tell us about any of that? <laughs> no, that didn't, that didn't get, there was nothing else shot with that dress. Um, I think there was a scene that we were going to shoot at the kind of hipster bar that we ended up not shooting. And then we we saw them after the fact in the uh, apartment with Sherman's uh, Platts that, that- Yes, yeah. Scene, um, where he's so brilliant. I mean, I have to say all our actors I, was such a joy. They were so great to work with. Um, yeah, if you, again, if you haven't seen the film, I mean, it's it, it, the yeah all the acting is amazing but yeah some of those guys particularly him he was just I mean yeah it's like again I, I mean, don't want yeah. to play <laughs> but you know um, yeah his reaction and you know the what 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 <laughs> what um, yeah uh, the dean there meeting with the yeah there he is he was yeah he was amazing <laughs> amazing the <laughs> the dean look meeting with the dean I think we just saw. Um, a yeah, little bit, um, yeah. Um, again, it's kind of a business. She's giving business, and what it, it's funny. I think it. I mean, I think it's genius of you because um, you know I do that sometimes. Where if I have to go to a specific, um, I have to, an, a specific appointment, I sort of I, I dress for the part. <laughs> yeah, well, um, and, I mean and and I don't think I'm the only one who does. I think you know, and you did that so brilliantly because here she is she's going to go to the dean to talk to the dean and 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 she looks professional mm -hmm. yeah I think I mean what you just said is true of all of us we dress different ways for different reasons and that's part of the work that we do as costume designers is figuring out those reasons what are you wanting to portray who are you wanting to be in mm. this moment? I mean you know like like the actor Sam which you know in the first scene you see him in, he's in a suit and tie. And then, you know, on the weekend, he's a whole other character. <laughs> and we we can all be like that, you know? We all are like we are all like that to some extent, I would say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, hit um the sweater, the um, like, you know, perfect um boyfriend look. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just like, I mean, come on. I mean, the, the, when, when I I, how do you how do you costume this? Um, uh, you want mom to like him. What's that look? And Nancy Steiner done got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bo has the most gorgeous blue eyes. If you can't see him there, they're there. Um, and this color was just so great on him. And I, you know, it's it's about the softness of the sweater and 
you know, he just feels approachable. He does not feel like, you know, uh, he feels like someone you want to meet. Yeah. Yeah. Nice guy. Yeah. Like, I, I just want to have a cappuccino and maybe some ice cream with yeah. him. <laughs> Here, feel my cashmere sweater. <laughs> So you really, um, you, you're thinking of texture and what that is, yeah. how that is going to come across to um, people watching it, an audience, and even the texture, not just color, but texture is talking to us. Yes? Yes, most certainly. Wow. Yeah. I mean, well, and it also affects the way the actors feel. You know, when you're wearing something stiff, it makes you move yeah. differently. Mm -hmm. But something soft, you know, you're just comfortable and um, all of, the, we use a bunch of tricks like that, you know, um, for character purposes to make the actor feel different ways. Nice. Those of you costume design students who are attending this, please make sure you're taking notes for the future from uh, costume designer, Nancy Steiner. All right, let's talk about the final nurse costume a little birdie told tells me that you you got to work and you turned on that sewing machine is that birdie correct it's not me <laughs> no. <laughs> no we have professionals that do that. i mean i know how to sew but um no i mean costume designers are way too busy to be Sewing. To be going in there. <laughs> I mean, we were already shooting uh, when we made this dress. These these scenes were towards the end of the shooting schedule. So um, we were having this made. I was researching it and designing it and then having fittings with Carrie in between, you know, her scenes on set. I mean, you know, to get this right. Mm. Um, so we had very little time, but we had to make, um, we made a, a few of these just in case for the action. And um, just so it, you know, if it one ripped, we could have a backup. Right, right. And, um, you know, I just, we, I, I designed it, you know, just kind of based on all the tacky, naughty nurses I saw on line, but also, for the movement that happens in the scene. So it had to have a fuller skirt instead of a tight skirt. Right. Zipper. Um, we like the longer sleeves on it. So certain things, you know, for different reasons. Right. You you did a you did a, a amazing job of tiptoeing through not telling so anything about what what happens. Just I love the fact that you're like. The skirt had to be slightly A-line. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. All right, so let's talk about some of your other films. Um, as much as we love Promising Young Woman, I, we have to talk about some of your, your past work for other film and TV shows, costumes. Um, let's start with The Virgin Suicides. This is 1999 and um, uh, Nancy must have been 12 when she <laughs> costume designed uh, this film, you know, the aesthetic, I know it, it, it has influenced an, an entire generation of four teenage girls, um, <laughs> with their, with their heads in the clouds. Um, you know, these, the, the, so I call them the gunny sack dresses, these floral printed, the prom dresses, uh, for the Lisbon sisters. Um, talk about the, the, um, yeah, the provenance, how you got there, uh, where they came from. Did you get them made? Um, you know, how did that get to be where you thought, yes, these girls, this is what they would wear? Um, well, yes, I did make them and design them. Um, I was lucky enough to find this incredible fabric, this cotton fabric in, we were shooting in Toronto. It was actually 1998 when we were shooting. Um, but I found this fabric all the same pattern, but with different color flowers. One had yellow, one had blue, one had, ah. and one had all of them. And I thought this is perfect because their mom is this very frugal woman. And my whole idea for it was that she got one pattern at the mm. and she made all those dresses by hand. 
And, you know, patterns, I'm, I don't know who sews here anymore, but, um, you know, you get a pattern for a dress and it has, well, it could have the long sleeve or it could have the puff sleeve. Mm -hmm. It could have this neckline. Yeah, and I, long, it could be short, yeah. Yeah, so my, my uh, vision for this was that their mom got one pattern and made all the dresses from that one pattern. <laughs> for all the sisters. <laughs> Yeah. For all the sisters. Where are those dresses now? I don't have any idea. Any idea. <laughs> to Sophia, I don't really know. I wish I right. knew. Yeah. I, I, another thing, a lot of people think that, oh, that the, uh, all the stars get the, you know, get to take their wardrobe home. I know I've had friends who are like, wait, don't they? And I know there are some very, 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 very A-list stars, you know, I think of, 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 um, you know, I don't, I don't know, some that, that put it in their contract, you yeah. know, that they get something or other, for, but for the most part, it's the studios that get right. them. A lot of people think you do, you do. Wherever that is, it goes back to the production, um, whether it be a studio or an independent, you put it in boxes at the end of the show and who knows where it goes. <laughs> now, but if they came from Western costume or the rental houses that you talk about, they go back to them. Yes, they do. But we also make things at Western Costume. They have a tailor shop. And so you can have them make things that you can own as well. But yes, if you rent it, it goes back to the costume. It goes back to them. Mm -hmm. All right. Talk about Little Miss Sunshine, um, oh. 2006. Um, yes. I know so many people that love, love this. The, the colors, the looks. Um, um, yeah, what, what, what were your, you know, what, what was your overall theme or inspiration? Well, this was such a fun film to work on, such a great script. And it was um, even better because I was working with two of my very good friends, Jonathan Dayton and Valerie Ferris. It was their first directorial mm. feature. And I had been working with them for years doing videos and commercials. So we'd been waiting for this and um, you know, when it came to be, it was just all in. We had been like talking about it for five years before, and then wow. it finally happened. And, um, you know, it just went quickly. We got an amazing crew. Abigail Breslin at that age was incredible. Mm -hmm. Just, and, you know, this was like an, you know, average people in an average place. <laughs> And, you know, just trying to find the right silhouettes for them each, the right colors, so that they all work together in a nice way. Yeah, when you look, like, for example, you look at this and you see that they have their, their sort of color story, color way. You see Abigail, you see that, that because of the pinks, like, oh, they kind of belong together. You know, yeah. and I know sometimes it, it, that's a, a, something that you're trying to tell the audience. Like, do you, you know, do you see that? Like they're wearing similar colors, therefore they're in the same family, belong together. Um, so some of that is purposeful, right? Yeah, I didn't necessarily want them all in the same colors, but I just wanted them, all the colors to work together, however that is. But looking at this picture, I do see, you know, Abigail and and um, Tony are in the has pink and also um, the pink shirt that Steve's right. wearing. Um, but I think more than anything, it's just that everything looks okay together, and there's yeah. not too much pattern or too much solid. And of course, Paul Dano isn't in this shot, but um, you know he was around also a lot too, and Alan Arkin. Um, who you know rounded out the team right <laughs> now because you said that you this is something that you guys have been you know you you knew about it for five years waiting for it were you pre were you already kind of pre-costuming it like were you shopping were you finding things in vintage stores or were you thinking of something designing did you already come with a nice mood board <laughs> let's just say <laughs> Actually, I didn't work on it before they got the green light because we had no idea who was going to be cast. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that, um, you know, I think a lot of contemporary costume design or, or any costume design, the casting has a lot to do with the colorways you're going to go for each person, their skin tone, what's right. going to put on them and not. 
And then it's like a puzzle and piecing, you know, putting all the characters together with, with whatever works on them as their character and making sure they all fit together as a whole. Um, so I didn't really start until, until we got the green light, you know, cause we were working on all sorts of other different projects. Right, right. Um, Twin Peaks, uh, you know, it's like, I read, I think there were 270 actors and 18 episodes. And I think you said it was like shooting an 18 hour movie. And when I read that, I was like, oh Jesus, like, yeah. <laughs> like that is, that is a lot. And I know you must have had some pressure because you know, they, they, there's a, 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 a big fan base and they have their, they have a lot of thoughts on what <laughs> what should should be going on with anything regarding Twin Peaks. Um, yeah, talk about talk about the costumes, talk about the pressure, um, you know, and what an intensive, intensive um, journey that must have been. Yeah, it was a big surprise when it came to me. Um, I was very flattered to have David uh, trying, you know, trying to work with me or wanting to work with me. Um, and not, uh, not until I started talking to them, of course I had worked, or, or I'm sorry, I had watched the original Twin Peaks back in the day. It was all the rage and it was so yeah. interesting and so different from anything else. And, um, I knew of it and I had watched it, but I was never like aware of the fan base. <laughs> 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 and how huge it was and how I was going to be working costuming characters 20 years later. Mm. And so things that worked for them then wouldn't necessarily work for them now. Um, and I just wanted to be as true to the characters and David and the fans. And um, I was thinking about the fans the whole time. Wow. Um, just in the back of my head that, you know, I wonder what they would think of this character older here and that one there. And, you know, the reveal of Diane, which was a huge thing. Nobody knew who she was for all those years. And, years, yeah. Um, what does that, what is, you know, what does Diane look like? And um, so it was, it was a huge challenge and, um, I feel really grateful that I was able to do it and make some more, you know, hopefully iconic costumes that come out of it. Um, the cast was amazing. Everybody, my crew was amazing. I mean, you again, you know, you cannot do this on your own. It takes <laughs> a village. And I wish I could name every person that worked. <laughs> um, but it's it's team effort, you know, and um, when it comes when it comes together, it's it's just such a joy and it's so satisfactory or so, it's a satis satisfying, let's say, yeah. <laughs> Was it one of the biggest projects that you um, had to get your hands on? I mean, I I I can only I mean I can't even imagine like how many in your team. For, for 270 actors and 18 episodes, you know, something like this. Did you, when you got, when you got the gig, you were like, okay, I need to gather, I need to gather the troops here. <laughs> yeah, well, every time you start a project, it's a whole effort to get a crew together. And, mm -hmm. you know, you, you are calling people night and day to find out first of all, who's available, mm -hmm. second of all, if they want to go out of town, do they want to work this long on a project? It's it's a whole puzzle, another puzzle to make. Mm. Um, so you call the people you you know first, and then you start calling the, the rest. <laughs> and you know, this was a long project. It was ten months. It was the longest project I've done. Um, although you know, many many films take much longer, but. Um, you know, we went through, I went through different people, different people were there. I, sometimes it wasn't the right fit. So I would get some new people. Sometimes you have 
more costumers on shopping or on set, depending on how many people, actors are on set. Um, but it wasn't a huge crew. It wasn't a huge budget. It was, the time frame was tight as, you know, always. So, um, you know, I, ha I think there was, and then I had an assistant on for a while that got her own gig and she needed to go. And so, you know, it's, it's constantly moving. Any production you're on, no matter mm -hmm. how long or short, it's constantly moving and morphing. And so people change, things change, circumstances change, and you just have to go with the flow. Just go with it. Well, we, I love, love the variety um, of your work and your costume design uh, um, and what in this, this, you know, how you help tell the story and, and, and visually tell the story. And like I said, with Promising Young Woman, I love, you know, when I read that you wanted to, you know, she was costuming herself for mm -hmm. the certain roles that she wanted to portray. I, I just, I, I, I just, you know, I, I messed with that. Um, mm -hmm. Going back to uh, um, Promising Young Woman, is there anything that you, uh, any costume that you made or that you wanted to put that didn't make the cut? And could you tell us what that was? Oh, there was a couple really sweet sweaters that I didn't get in there. Some Angora sweaters, vintage ones that I loved, but there just wasn't enough room for them. <laughs> <laughs> what makes you, um, you know, again, with Promising Young Woman, I know, look, I, the, this I loved. I loved the mom and dad outfits were great. Um, you know, I yeah. thought that that was just, just perfect um, for them. Um, because it, it just, I could see, you know, I, I looked at the interior decor, like okay. those paintings and the, 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 the curio cabinet. And I could just see people who, ha who own that would dress right. like that. <laughs> yep. They <do. laughs> right. Um, they do. What, uh, if, I know it seems like a very general question, but what are you most proud of in terms of, uh, working with promising young woman? Oh gosh. Well, I'm just, I'm proud to be a part of a film that's so um, well received and so um, enjoyed by a lot of people. And I, and also that has a message of some sorts. It's yes, <laughs> but there's also a message. And that was really attractive to me about the script. And I'm just thrilled that everybody's into it and I'm thrilled for Emerald. I'm thrilled for Carrie. Um, Emerald, I think is a really, really, really talented woman who's just got a great point of view and a great vision. And, and I just, I hope I get to work with her again soon. I think it, I, it definitely has touched many, many people. Um, all right, I think we're opening up to uh, questions and answers. I hope everybody's been I know, I know that everybody's been putting in their questions. And so we're gonna try to answer them. Are you ready, Nancy? I'm ready. Okay, here we go. And by the way, the lighting is amazing <laughs> behind you. I mean, I can't even start you giving me For like- a few more minutes. <laughs> oh, I mean, you are lit, my dear. You are lit. And then you've got the shadow in the back. You. It's you, a beautiful day in Los Angeles. We're so- oh to be here. <laughs> you, I'm just going to tell you a little sidebar before we started. She's like, I apologize. I don't have a, a, um, a, a you, what do you call it? A ring light. And I don't know. And she's just like, you know, it's, I'm just going to go dark. And then here we are 5.45 PM Pacific Standard Time. And she is like movie star lit. Yeah, please. All right. Let's start the questions. What is your what is your creative process? Do you use any uh, methodology? Do you follow some steps to stay creative? Well, I think every project brings up new ideas. And, you know, if you, obviously you do research, but I, you know, I'm, I'm inspired as many designers are by so many things, um, art, music, Nature is a really big inspiration for me. I know it doesn't always literally look like that's in the mix, but it is somehow, you know? So, um, 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I don't have a method necessarily. You just start, you read, you meet with the director, you figure out what their vision is, because really it's about their vision, not mine. I'm trying to serve them. So, um, you know, just, and then you just go and find what feeds you for those characters, whether it be art or music or fashion or some old films. Um, it's just everywhere. It's everywhere. Wonderful, wonderful answer. Okay, next up, what are your thoughts on the idea uh, some people might perceive as Cassie not dressing her age? Ooh. Mm. Oh, mm. Well, <laughs> is that Cassie's age or Carrie's age? Mm. That's all I want to say about that. Mm. I'm going to do a. Mm. Mm. Okay, we're that done there. Good. All right, next. Um, how did the concept of the male gaze shape Cassie's wardrobe? The what? The male gaze. The male gaze. The male gaze. Yes. Uh, well, I, as I said before, I don't think she was really, even though she looked nice, I don't think she was looking for male attention. That's why we never made any necklines too low or mm, anything. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really about that. In fact, she's mostly covered up. I think the only really body conscious thing was that leotard, uh, the pink leotard in the cafe. But otherwise, you don't really see her body shape that much. She's wearing sweaters and a t-shirt that's a little bigger or things like that. She's not really showing it off too much. Yeah. I mean, you're right. When I think about it now, is she's not shouting. It's not like she wants mm -hmm. to enter a room and have everyone look at her. No. I mean, you know, it's it's pretty much she wants to blend in into the scene, like if it, it would, you know, if it would be an extra in that scene, and just you know, the, I think that the 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 thing that kind of then puts it to another level is, of course, when she starts acting pretend drunk, and that's what gets some of the. The right. attention from the from the men's is, right. <laughs> I would say, um, you know, for sure. All right, next question: What is the symbolism of Cassie walking barefoot at both the beginning and oh oh? Uh, you the, whoever asked this question, you got Miss Nancy Steiner smiling, walking <laughs> barefoot at both the beginning and end of the film. All right, go. Well. She was wearing high heels and they were uncomfortable. <laughs> That's the plain and simple about it. You know, it's that uh, walk of shame with the heels in your hand mm -hmm. in the beginning. And at the end, she didn't want to walk in the woods in those heels because she would fall. Mm, yeah. It was, you know, in the dark, you don't really want right. to walking in those big platform heels and and get caught on a root mm -hmm. so damn, I like that so. I like that so there's yeah. it was practical it was can practical. we say that practical yeah. all right <laughs> <laughs> um all right next question I love this we've got so many questions I'm glad that I'm getting to to ask you some of these questions okay as long as we have this fabulous movie star lighting that you've given us um, what is the conversation you have with hair and makeup? Um, uh, you know, do you talk through each outfit? Um, you know, what's the conversation like? <clears throat> well, it's different for every outfit and it's different depending on the time you have. Um, but I like to, <clears throat> once I have a fitting and we get the selects from the director, I always send the images of the actor to hair and makeup so they can see where we're going with this. And, and then we have a discussion about, you know, what's gonna be right, what's gonna look good. And, and, and it's also, you know, the director's vision. So um, we all work together to make those images, definitely. Costume comes first and then makeup? Yes. Um, traditionally, costume comes first and uh, then hair and makeup. Yeah, um, and some some costume designers actually oversee hair and makeup depending on how large of a production it is and 
you know, I, I do know costume designers who have gotten the wigs before and just know the periods and things like that. But yes, costumes first. All right. Next question. Um, since Promising Young Woman is a contemporary um, time period film, but what is the process, um, you know, for deciding which clothes are purchased and which ones are custom made uh, for you? Is, is there a process for you? Yeah, I mean, with anything, you wanna see what's out there. And, and if there's something that works right, you wanna get that first because it's less expensive usually. Yeah. But um, if there's certain things that you can't find out there or that you want to be custom made, then you just custom make them. And sometimes it's easier to just make them then look all over the place for something. Right. The hours it takes to do that. Mm. Sometimes it's just easier to get swatches and just make it. Yeah, no, I've heard, I've, when you have a time constraint. Right, right. Um, and and also, I mean, you if you want something custom, it's usually for the principals. Is that right? Like, because they're it depends. It or depends. it depends. Maybe you may be having to make uniforms or guards or th things. It it depends in in uh, contemporary costume, you know, it could be anything. Um, but so you would have to fit background actors in those, you know, restaurant costumes or airline costumes or right. uniforms of any sort, or if there's a color palette that you're sticking to, you know. You know, we had a question like and it was, get this, what is the process like for planning background characters and extras? Do you set guidelines and looks for them as well? I think we answered it, right? Well, yes, but just to just to um, give more clarity, every night before we, I mean, for contemporary, we send uh, what we call extra specs. So specs, we write out in an email what we want the background to wear, mm. to bring to the set of their own clothes so that they'll fit into the scene properly. And that means color-wise, texture-wise, uh, you know, where they are um, in a, the financial, you know, paradigm. Right. Are they, rich, are they poor? Um, all of these, we give all these specs the night before a shoot and it goes to the extras, um, extras casting and they send it out to all the extras. And then they come and every morning we look at them, we go through their stuff. If they don't have it, we give them something that's appropriate. Mm. You'd be surprised <laughs> how they come to the set sometimes. <laughs> dot, 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 <laughs> dot. <laughs> um, what is your face of, um, of um, let me see if I have something else for you. Yeah. I want you to do it for me right now. Like pretend you're looking at me. I showed up to the set, Nancy Steiner, costume designer, and you didn't really want uh, me to be wearing a dark pink jacket with a pink skinny tie. I'll say- Give it to me. I'll say, is that all you brought? And you'll say, yeah, I just kind of came in what I thought would be right. And I said, well, did you read the extra specs? <laughs> Oh, no, I didn't get them. <laughs> well, okay, what size shirt do you wear? <laughs> and then you start, that's and it. And then I go to my right. truck and I get something that's gonna work. You make it work. Make <laughs> I it love work. that. You just have to make it work. What was it like working with David Lynch and um, his very specific aesthetic and also um, a show that had an established continuity? Well, David, you know, is, it was amazing to work on the project and working with David, it was hard. I would say it was challenging. Um, he, he doesn't give you very much to go on. He kind of wants to see what you'll bring to the table. And although he's very specific, <laughs> so I mean, he said, I remember for one character, he was like, just put her in like what they all, you know, a regular suit. And that wasn't really what he wanted. <laughs> and I had to go through many fittings to actually figure out, oh no, he doesn't really want a regular suit. He wants something mm. a little more vintage looking and no, 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 no. So um, 
you know, it was, it was great. It was challenging and, and, you know, um, but I, what I will say is that show, every actor that came in my dressing room was so thrilled to be there. They were just like either total fans or I can't believe I'm here. I, I love Twin Peaks or I love David Lynch. So everybody was just thrilled, thrilled to be there. Um, I can I can imagine yeah <laughs> wow all right we've got uh one last question are you ready for this sure okay here we go you've had the opportunity to work with some incredible female filmmakers and creators who would be your dream uh your you know dream to work with next oh that's a hard one <laughs> that's why that's why it's the last one Wow. Um, I, I mean, I, I have to say, I loved Chloe Zhao's Nomadland. No. And I just thought it was so beautiful and so mm. subtle and touching. I mean, I know she's doing a Marvel movie right now, but <laughs> um, I would love to work with her. I would love to work with Sam Taylor Johnson. I think she's got an incredible eye. I've been a fan of her photography for a long time. Um, you know, um, there's, there's, I don't know, there's a lot of female directors um, that are coming up and I, I would love to work with more female directors. I just think, um, we've got our own stories to tell and our own ways of telling them. And I think it's really important in the zeitgeist. Yes, I agree. As a gay man, I completely and wholeheartedly agree. Oh, Phoebe Waller-Bridges. <laughs> Phoebe Waller-Bridges. Oh, there you go, there you go. All right, I actually, I lied. I have one more question. Okay. Just for you, just for you, Nancy. Uh, do you dress for the occasion or do you are is there a little bit of cassie in in how you dress for a certain you know a certain you know do you costume yourself for certain uh, appearances well of course i mean for certain events you wear certain things um i'm a very casual person and most important to me i like to be comfortable i'm not like on the cutting edge of fashion by any means. And although I appreciate it, um, my uh, my aesthetic is pretty, is it's, it's a little classic, maybe a little punk in there, maybe a little, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, more casual than anything. And um, I, yeah, I, so I, don't, I don't think I've still really grown up. <laughs> I mean, I've grown <laughs> out of my, you know, I'm, I don't know. I don't, I'm not a big fancy dresser. I don't know. Just pretty. It's a wonderful, wonderful answer. I think, especially knowing your, where you've come from and your whole, you know, pedigree of provenance <laughs> and punk rock and all that, you, 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 you are the real deal. So you, you can be as comfortable, comfortably punk as, 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 as you, you want to be. All right, everybody, please. Give a big round of virtual applause to the fabulous Nancy Steiner, costume designer for Promising Young Woman and so many other films and TV shows. We are so humbled and honored to have had you. You were amazing, wonderful, and you had beautiful lighting. So everybody, let's <laughs> give a big thank you to Nancy Steiner. Um, thank and you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Anybody who has not seen the movie, please go see it. So then you can fill in all the blanks that Nancy was so deft at just going around, around it. So uh, <laughs> we left a lot of, we left little holes here and there, right, Nancy? Yeah, <laughs> gotta see it. You gotta see it. So please join us for our upcoming virtual events, The Future of Fast Fashion on March 16th. And of course, our FIDM Spring Virtual Open House. That is March 20th at 10 a.m. And once again, if there are any of you out there who are wanna be or study 
costume design for film and TV. FIDM, we have our wonderful film and TV costume design program. Once again, one last thank you to Nancy Steiner. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you soon. Mwah. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.